uh, on online as well. So um, I'm going to hopefully speak into this microphone so that people can hear me better. Uh, but uh, just a few thanks uh, very briefly. So I want to thank for the funding uh, Heterodox Academy um, and the Institute for Liberal Studies who've provided um, some funds for this um, event. And then I also want to thank uh, uh, Rachel Altman, uh, Alexandra Lasova, and Mark Collard who've been uh, helping to uh, get this event uh, going as well. Um, so what I'll really do is introduce the the panel. Um, oops. So uh, we'll start with uh, Dave. So Dave Dio Yen, right here. So is a he is a student at Lincoln Alexander School of Law. Prior to law school, uh, he held roles related to diversity and inclusion at various organizations, including Export Development Canada, Chorus Entertainment, the City of Toronto, and Shopify. He also worked for the Independent Street Checks Review, which examined Ontario's regulation on police street checks. Advancing positive systemic change has been at the core of his community involvements. Dave is a member of Toronto Police Service, uh, Services Police and Community Engagement Review 2 Advisory Committee, the Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Working Group at McGill University's uh, DeSaltels Faculty of Management, and the Michelle Jean Foundation's uh, Board of Directors. All right, so moving on uh, to Sonia, next to, to Dave. So uh, Sonia Orlo is a PhD student in political science at Simon Fraser University and currently serves on the university's EDI Advisory Council. Her academic interests center around issues relating to identity politics and the political behavior of the African uh, diaspora in Canada. She is an essayist, a political commentator, and a creator of online educational materials that provide reasoned and informed perspectives on imp important social and political topics. So then uh, moving on to uh, Noah. So Noah Jarvis is an undergraduate student studying political science at York University and a reporter for True North. As a reporter for True North, Noah covers a wide range of stories from foreign affairs to local politics and everything in between. Noah writes and speaks on various issues from Canadian uh, made legislation, identity politics, political freedom, and other issues concerning the Canadian political landscape. He seeks to become a prominent voice with Canadian political discourse, changing Canadians' outlook on public policy. Uh, so then next up, we have uh, Grace Kim, who is a faculty member and PAL convener in the School of Communication at Capilano University. Her interests lie in policies, business, and social responsibility. Her position as an instructor allows her to deconstruct colonial power structures while preparing students for life outside the classroom in a globalized world and encourages diversity, equality, and equity. In addition, Kim's experiences span social media marketing, and she is an appointed commissioner for the South Korean government under the branch of the Institute of National Unification. Being a visible minority, allows her to share her experiences and include other narratives and ways of knowing through the lens of kindness and understanding. And then finally, uh, so we have Tani. Uh, so Tani Marx brings a varied background to the contemplation of equity, diversity, and inclusion that includes case management, dispute resolution, coaching and consulting, advocacy and referral, and project management. While Marx is not a lawyer, she completed her Bachelor of Law at McGill University in 2002. She has held positions with Friends for AIDS, Open Learning Agency, uh, BC Paraplegic Association, Van City, and Family Services of Greater Vancouver, all of which have allowed her to intersect with equity-deserving groups in both meaningful and challenging ways. Her most recent tenure, going on 12 years with Vancouver Community College as Arbiter of Student Issues, the college's uh, ombuds for student-centered issues, allows Marx to look at individual student complaints and more broadly, systemic issues at VCC helping to shore up gaps in processes and protocols to make VCC an ever increasingly just and fair place to work and learn. Her volunteer engagement has included briefing on lived experience and issues of discrimination regarding physical disability to the nursing field, volunteering with the McGill Legal Information Clinic, volunteering with the Canadian Red Cross's first contact program serving refugee claimants and membership in the Association of Canadian College and University Ombudspersons Ad Hoc Equity Committee. Uh, Marx is, a passion, uh, is passionate about equity and fairness and feels privileged to learn about, support and promote fairness, equity and natural justice in her work. Uh, while Marx feels fortunate to work at VCC, she is here today on her own behalf as an individual with both an imperfect understanding of EDI 
and lived professional and volunteer experience in equity, diversity, and inclusion. So um, we've got each panelist is going to have eight minutes, and then we're going to open things up to a Q&A. So, uh, so Grace, um, you're up first. Oh, and, great. and just, yeah, and, and so the microphone, if it's red, then I think it should be on. It should be testing. Okay. Yes. I, how close do I need to be? Or do I need to just project? Would that be better? Okay. <laughs> so uh, thank you everyone for having me and all of us here today. Um, I would like to make a little bit of a land acknowledgement from where I'm kind of coming from. So Capilano University, and it's one of those weird things about land acknowledgements, because it's kind of like, am I doing it because I really understand why I'm doing it? Is it like an action that we're kind of going through the motions kind of type thing? And it was one of those moments where I had to sit down and think about, okay, what does this mean for not just me, but all the community members here? So for us, I think it is one of those things where we can have a conversation and even just starting these land acknowledgements kind of let people know in the forefront of their consciousness about where we're coming from and where we'd like to go. So Capilano University, very, very humbly grateful um, that we live, work, and play on the unceded lands of the Lillawat, Musqueam, Sea Shelt, Slated Tooth, and Squamish Nation. Um, personally, I live and reside on the Quiquitlam Nation, so that's Coquitlam for the white tongue. And um, I'm a faculty member at Capital University. So Andy, thank you for introducing me, um, communication. And I also interestingly teach business as well. And so it's a really interesting kind of dynamic where I have um, the theory and the practice that goes together. I'm here representing the faculty association as well. And um, I'm really grateful for the land here that- Oh, sorry, Grace, can you a little closer? Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Okay, you know what? I can't project as much yeah. as I thought. Okay, and I'm really grateful that the land here is physically connecting me to all of you today. So thank you so much. Um, I would like to share a story. And it's one of those things where uh, it's, it really resonated with me because even after all these years, it can't really go away from my heart. So it was one of these uh, end of the semester terms, you know, where you say goodbye to your students, right? And then they had this comment where they said, Grace, I never, I never met a teacher like you before, like who looked like me. And that kind of struck me a little bit because this student has been at the university for years and it just kind of gave me pause because I'm like, oh, that's really interesting because this student is a younger generation than me. And I know that I'm from a younger generation from my predecessors. And for me, I've been experiencing and been exposed to a lot of diversity and, and, and abilities and different people. So I couldn't really figure out what was happening and I kind of noticed a disconnect. So what is happening in my lived experiences versus my students' lived experiences and how they couldn't really see themselves in higher education in any way, shape, or form. But also, what are the assumptions that I have and that I was making, and is this really important or relevant? And I had to sit there and say, yeah, you know what? It really is. And whether it's in the form of being a role model or even just a face you know, that you can put to the institution, it is really relevant for us to kind of sit and consider how EDI can matter to us, right? In whatever form that we choose to take. So from that experience, it kind of made me stop and think about, okay, is there something that I can do on an individual level more than anything else? So kind of dug around and I was talking to some people and, and it goes beyond just having activities in our classroom to see um, how we can make and kind of build thoughtful communities and citizens um, in this global society. And so when, I was kind of digging around and asking a lot of questions. I found out that we did have an EDI committee. And even a few years ago, it started with our vice provost. And so she made an action committee to talk about um, the alignment of how we can support not just our students, but faculty and other members of our community. And so it kind of came from our university uh, policies of Envision 2030, which is about um, service community, you know, and how we can grow in addition to the human rights code. And so one of the things that came up was an actual wonderful committee, but I don't know if it was during COVID, it was just the way that we communicated our vision, how we can implement these, these action plans. 
it, it kind of fell apart, unfortunately. And so the real challenge that we've kind of had at our institution is about how we can come together and even think about what our goals are, how we have different communication styles, our leadership styles, um, and actually just who's involved, who has access um, to any kind of information at all. And so the desire has always been there. And then thankfully it, you know, even though the committee kind of disbanded, it's still continuing or the spirit still kind of lives on, not just in terms of our workshops that we have, right? In terms of our, hello, in terms of our, sorry, that was teacher mode for me. <laughs> it's one of those things, uh, not just in terms of how we can engage with the community in the form of workshops or in the form of policies, because Capilano does have an EDI policy where we are working hard to ensure that we have safe spaces and we can create um, access and equity to those who don't. And so when we have these workshops about um, LGBTQ community and anti-racism and, you know, um, even recently, we have a um, indigenous framework of education, right? Where we were working with our elders and community members, our students, our faculty, on how we can make sure that we are connecting and making sure that we kind of decolonize the structure of the institution, which is very odd in and of itself, because where would we exist, right? If we cease to exist, but understanding a new way of learning and having a new way of being that's a little bit more organic was really important to us. So while that's kind of on pause at the moment for us to kind of really sit down and listen to one another, um, this is kind of where we're at right now. And so, Going back to the story, sorry. Um, stories for me, I think are really important because EDI, while the policies are wonderful and we have a lot of lovely reports and, and we do surveys, sometimes it is very difficult because you know there could be a lack of engagement, right? Or people just don't feel safe to actually voice their concerns. So for us and what we've kind of noticed is it all comes down to people and stories and how they connect to one another and how we're able to really reach the hearts and not just the minds of individuals. And so while we have these policies in place and we're making sure that we have all these workshops um, for inclusion and diversity, we also have other activities that are happening. Um, and one of them kind of actually came out from a story from one of our faculty members who was dealing with a lot of racism um, during COVID. And so, um, she looked like me. <laughs> and even though, she, um, as you can tell, probably by my last name, I'm Korean, even though I'm kind of made in Canada, but you know, I'm sure there's something about me that's made in China too. Um, she felt really alienated and she dealt with a lot of overt and covert racism. And from the stories that she was telling to the university members and what can be actually done and, and what is happening and how do we make sure that we create a space of kindness or, or understanding, we came up with a series of change education. And so it's faculty and student led where we're able to create a lot of moments or create a lot of um, academic learning or any kind of fun social moments that kind of brings the community together. So recently we did Asian History Month, or sorry, we are in the planning of Asian History Month, Black History Month, Women's History Month, you know, Indigenous Months. So there's a lot of pull and a lot of desire that allows us to work together, but I think that is kind of really challenging in that sense where we kind of um, try to bring everyone together, but I always feel like there's a spark of hope, right? Because we all have our own stories that we need to tell. Um, just just one, one minute, Grace. One more, okay, sorry. Yeah. And then it's all up to us to listen. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I would like to say. And that's what I'd like to really share. And Thank you so much. And um, I look forward to having more conversations. And even more importantly, I look forward to listening to your stories. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Great. <laughs> okay, awesome. So now we're gonna go to Sonia. So your eight minutes. Hi everyone, um, my name is Sonia Orlu and I am a PhD student in the Department of Political Science 
here at SFQ. So um, I guess we're hosting <laughs> this event. Um, but I'm going to use my time today to talk about what's what's happening um, in terms of EDI at SFU and um, where I see the general goals of EDI and what I think the goals should be. Uh, but first and foremost, I want to say that I'm speaking as a student. Um, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of myself. Um, I can only speak to EDI from the perspective that just I engage with the university. So a faculty member like Mark would, would have a totally different experience, I guess. Um, an administrator will have a totally different experience. Uh, but I'm trying to be as objective as possible uh, in my assessment of EDI at SFU. So SFU has what it's called um, an equity compass. And this is supposed to be a, a strategic plan uh, for the next five years uh, that guides the institution's um, sort of processes, um, uh, I guess, administration, uh, academic endeavors, research endeavors uh, for the next five years. And according to uh, the, the strategic plan, the the preeminent goal of this of this equity compass is respect, inclusion, and belonging. Now that all sounds really great. Um, and who who doesn't want respect? Who doesn't want to be included? And who doesn't want to belong? Um, but if we do break down uh, those those terms, if we look at the equity compass itself, uh, we get to a point where we see a lot of nice sounding words um, without really having any clear meaning as to what those words really mean in practice um, and how it will affect the different groups uh, in a university. Now, SFU is not different from most other universities in, in Canada that have embraced EDI uh, in, in recent years. Uh, there is now a VP of equity, diversity, and inclusion, which we're seeing in universities across uh, Canada. Uh, and so this, this is put at the center uh, of, of uh, the university's endeavors. So there is the attempt, the university claims, uh, to balance, to try to balance academic freedom with uh, this considerations for equity. Um, how much that is possible is still yet to be seen. Um, but I, I, I wanna bring attention to the fact that even though the way this equity compass is being projected, it seems to be non-ideological. The way it's written is supposed to be non-ideological, but we know that EDI is ideological. EDI is rooted in critical theory. Um, it is, not very, um, it's not very objective in its assessment of reality. It's a very subjective understanding of the world that we live in. Now, that doesn't mean that that's wrong. It just means that the way that we engage with equity, diversity, and inclusion is to be a little bit more critical, um, uh, is to be a little bit more skeptic, is to be a little bit more uh, in search of, of reasoned, uh, policies in search of reasoned ideas, ideas that can actually be implemented in, in reality and not either exclude people, ask for conformity, or reproduce inequalities. Uh, so we have, there are certain terms that I would sort of want to go over, um, the way that the university sort of explains them and the way that I see them. So first is the the actual concept of equity. So the university says uh, equity is the work we do to identify and address systemic barriers, particularly those experienced by members of underrepresented or disadvantaged groups. So again, identifying and addressing systemic barriers, um, which is a very noble goal. Um, there are different groups at, at SSU or in any university in Canada or North America or anywhere um, that do indeed um, sort of have systemic barriers. Uh, speaking as a Nigerian Canadian, I came to Canada as, a, as an international student um, uh, 12, 13 years ago to 2010. Uh, and I did have 
struggles uh, as an international student uh, that I had to deal with. And having the university help me with those struggles, I think was very instrumental with my growth as a person and as a scholar. Um, so I don't necessarily think that that is a, a negative thing, but equity itself is about producing equal outcomes. How possible is that um, without engineering situations, without, without taking from others and giving to others? Um, so it is one thing to identify the systemic barriers. It's another thing to accurately uh, dis determine the ways that they will be addressed. And then there is the concept of diversity. Uh, for SFU, diversity means encouraging demographic representation of equity deserving groups. So these are LGBTQ plus um, uh, people, uh, people uh, who are minoritized, um, minoritized races, women, and, and so on and so forth. So we see here that diversity is about specific identities um, and nowhere here in, at, at, at least in this equity compass, does diversity include viewpoint diversity. Um, and as someone who is on the EDI Council, I stated on my first day at the meeting that I'm there for viewpoint diversity. I am not there to check a quota for being a Black um, a student. Um, I am there to ensure that the university adheres to academic freedom and allows a diverse, a breadth of, of, um, of, of viewpoints, whether, whether people agree or not, uh, shouldn't, shouldn't be the point. The point should be that uh, within certain spaces in the university, we have uh, a plurality of, of perspectives. Uh, and then there's inclusion, a community where all are welcome, safe, accepted, and appreciated in learning, teaching, researching, and working. All are welcome. Is that what happens in practice? I don't think so. Um, <laughs> so we, we do have a lot of work to do uh, in, in that sense. Uh, if you are a white Christian male, I don't think you're part of that all, um, at, at least not in, in a full sense. Um, and so certain voices are privileged while, while others are, are um, minimized. Um, and so there, there is, there's a need to actually question when we talk about inclusion, what that actually means. Are we really including, are we creating the space where all are welcome, regardless of where they come from, what they think, uh, what their backgrounds are, uh, all needs to be all. Um, and then we have uh, terms like decolonization. Now that's a very, <laughs> very, very contentious one uh, because it's not clear what decolonization means. What exactly do, do, do uh, are we talking about tearing down structures that have existed? Are we talking about redressing systemic harms? What exactly is decolonization? For SFU, it means that we get to integrate ways to unlearn and redress historical and current practices that have had deleterious effects uh, on indigenous people and other people groups uh, that have experienced colonization. Sorry, one minute. Okay. Um, so that, that is interesting uh, because when we actually look at the way decolonization, the, the discourse of this decolonization has been implemented in, ver in various academic spaces, it's about getting rid of anything with hint of colonialism or coloniality. Um, there is there is uh, uh, a dismissal of of, of practices, uh, even down to things like science. The scientific method uh, is seen as a colonial art artifact. We are at a university. If we don't use a scientific method, what else are we doing here? Um, so those are things that, and then we have concepts like anti-racism. What exactly does that mean? Does anti-racism mean, mean looking at race or privileging race in all the decisions that we make? Because anti-racism would only reinforce racism if we do not uh, take a measure of color indifference uh, in the way that we, we interact with each other. So my goal as, as a student at SFU, and I hope as a, as a public, a person who engages in, in public dialogue with people, 
is to create a, a, an academic environment or to try to, to inspire an academic environment where uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion does, does not become conformity, um, uh, sameness, and inequality or an exclusion. And that we make universities first and foremost institutions of teaching, learning, and research. Academic integrity, academic freedom, and viewpoint diversity are all central to that goal. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, so we're going to go to Tani. So. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I, I really appreciate the first two perspectives and, um, you know, what I have to say speaks quite a bit to, to Sonia's point. Um, I've, I'm both grateful and frustrated that we're in an era in public post-secondary where we actually get to actually delve into uh, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, indigenization, and decolonization. Um, but I'm also cognizant of the context in which we're limited by the discussion that we can have in the public post-secondary um, institution sector. And so one of the frustrations, you know, I'm grateful that we're talking about it, I'm grateful that we're here, but one of the frustrations that I've, I've had, um, you know, for, for more than a decade at this point has been the overemphasis on uh, performance activities, right? So because we work in institutions that are inherently political and risk adverse, um, we go for the low hanging fruit, which includes painting um, um, rainbow flags on walls and holding ceremonial uh, flag raising for um, things or, or, or celebrations like a trans person's day, we, we spend a lot of time in doing that. But what we don't spend any time, at least not in my institution or my experience outside the institution, is dwelling in the meta issues that exist that create these situations of inequity. And so individual initiatives perhaps are things that are the low hanging fruit that we tend towards, but meta EDI issues is not something that, for example, my institution is ready to look at. And so that shift in paradigm is actually what we need to do to answer Grace and Sonia's questions and concerns, right? We can't just uh, try to retrofit everything. So right now, I find that public post-secondary is into retrofitting things to fit that EDI mold, right? So we come out with the policy and then we try to retrofit it to make sure that we're hitting the Jedi um, words and, and issues that we want to hit. So for example, um, uh, once wheelchair ramps were retrofits to buildings, right? There were a way in which we recognized that there was discrimination and inequity happening to people in wheelchairs. But now we've, we've traveled a distance where actually building codes and bylaws require that buildings build access into the building. And so um, what I'm looking for is that type of approach to Jedi and indigenization and decolonization in the academy. For example, um, we talk about um, equity into uh, the academy, but then we're not talking about building equity issues into hiring practices, right? I myself am an administrator at the college, but it doesn't matter if you're part of QP staff or administration or faculty, why are we not designing job descriptions, for example, not just to read in or read out people with regard to their expertise on their subject matter, their field, but also to read in and to test for equity quotient understanding of Jedi indigenization and decolonization. Uh, in the job that people are applying for. So for me, you know, we're, there's this tension between utter and out focus on the method of the way we do things, right? So the method is something that again is low hanging fruit. So we open, we open uh, uh, meetings and we open um, events 
with a land acknowledgement and and we um we do things like um we engage more consultative processes around policy and initiatives etc things like that but what we don't do for example is we don't evaluate lived experience when we're hiring people for the academy and if we do evaluate lived experience we usually don't put it on par with professional experience so that completely negates our you know we are a, an equitable and a hire we 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 at bcc for example hire based on equitable principles what exactly does that mean and that speaks primarily to sonia's point you know these are lovely words and terms and ideologies but how do they actually hit the road in practice and so um another example i'm an, i'm the ombudsperson over at bcc and so I am tasked with ensuring that procedural fairness, natural justice, relational fairness, and substantive fairness are embedded into uh, decisions around complaints, et cetera, that are made that impact students. Why are we not doing that for everything that we do? Why is it just a formal complaint that gets the benefit of procedural fairness and natural justice? Why doesn't every action or initiative that we start up at BCC include in it a lens of procedural fairness and natural justice. So I guess the question for me is, are we stopping at method? Is method all there is? Is uh, raising the rainbow flag all we're ever gonna get to? Are we ever gonna tap into the meta theory and the meta issues behind inequity? And so um, I think, you know, for me, all public post-secondaries, BCC is not alone, but all, public post-secondaries are really stalled at the pre-contemplative process, right? So we spend inordinate amounts of resources, not just BCC, but throughout the academy, we spend an inordinate amount of resources for hiring researchers and consultants to do the work and do some surveys and et cetera, et cetera. But it's really all about readiness. Like the last survey we did at VCC was about equity readiness wasn't even about whether or not we're, we're ready to involve equity into the campus. And so for me, that's quite frustrating because we already have tools that permit us to actually hit the ground running. So when you look at the BC Human Rights Code, Section 42, there's an exemption there for equity hires, for redressing past harm, for redressing uh, individuals that have not had the privilege, they're not the white male Christian person that has had the privilege to access employment or education. There is a section already in our BC Human Rights Code. All we need to do is apply for it, pull the lever, and then boom, we're ready to go. What we don't need is another 10 thou to hire a consultant to explain to us exactly what lever should we be pulling. It already exists. So you know, this idea that we need to be really perfectly prepared before we pull every, any lever whatsoever. We want to make sure that, you know, we're not going to be offensive to any particular group. And we don't want to take a step for fear that in terms of risk management, we get, might get sued or might be called out onto the carpet. Perfection is the enemy of the good. And I feel that public post-secondary is stalled right now at, at the pre-contemplative stage because precisely they're afraid to make a mistake. They're going to offend Tani over at the Arbiter of Student Issues office because of, you know, disability issues, or they're going to offend Grace because of, you know, her visible minority issues, or they're going to offend Sonia, you know, because uh, it might not be, you know, a, a, a freedom, a academic freedom, uh, that comes into play. This, this is a problem. So this is colonial. We're scared. We're looking for a perfect solution. And while we're waiting, we're creating more and more harm. And just, just one minute. And so for me, you know, what we really need to do is we need to start with the building block of surveying who our community is. We are so scared in public post-secondary 
that we can't even survey our faculty, staff, administrators, students, and, and um, individuals to see who are they? What makes up the college or the university? How many people with disabilities? How many people that are living on the margins? We're too scared to even have that survey. And so I'm just gonna end with, I'm really not interested in changing hearts and minds. Sorry, Grace. <laughs> I'm really not interested in changing hearts and minds. I think that that's a fool's errand. It's not about changing someone's dark heart. I'm all for freedom of thought. You're a dark heart, dark horse, that's no problem. But I do want to see your behavior on campus changed. Okay, thank you, Tenny. All right, so we're gonna to go to Noah, your eight minutes. All right. And yeah, just if you can stay closer to the microphone, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is this okay? Yeah, it's good. All right, so um, I'm coming from DEI from a different perspective than I think most of the panelists here. Uh, I think that you know there are a lot a lot of problems with DAI that uh, I've identified that I've identified you know just going through uh, high school and through my uh, current university education. Um, I think that there are many problems with the assumptions that DEI makes, and also I think that there's a lot of problems with what emerges from uh, you know the ideas of DEI um, when it comes to DEI policy and whatnot. You know because I think that you know as uh, Frederick Engel says. Um, what um, what everyone what when an individual wills is uh, obf obfuscated by what everyone else and what emerges is what something no one willed, uh, and I think that is uh, that holds true with the DEI policy. So what just in general, what are the assumptions that DEI is based off of? Because DEI is a fruit from a much larger tree. Um, it, look, DEI uh, is influenced from the idea of intersectionality. Intersectionality is a concept. That was coined by uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, who is a uh, pro prolific uh, academic in the United States, who has uh, contributed to the fields of critical race studies as well as, you know, coining uh, the term intersectionality. And intersectionality more or less seeks to uh, seeks to identify the different identities that uh, each each of each and every one of us hold, and seek to construct, you know, whether or not uh, seek to construct and identify one's privilege. Uh, within the society based on their identities. Uh, so for example, for me, uh, I'm a black uh, straight male uh, because of my uh, black, uh, because of my blackness, uh, I am a, um, a, 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 I'm a, uh, inherently oppressed, uh, but because I'm a male and I'm straight, I do have these other components to which uh, I, I have been a historic uh, oppressor. There's the, uh, a strong idea uh, within intersectionality, within critical race studies, within uh, queer theory, within feminism, uh, that there are two types of people in the world. There are oppressors, uh, and then there are the oppressed. So when you have, uh, to include into the oppressors category, you have uh, straight, uh, people are straight, you have men, you have uh, white people, uh, and you have um, uh, people who have been have his have uh, been the privilege been, been privileged with historic uh, historic privilege and uh, the uh, those who are oppressed would include uh, black people that would include uh, uh, people who are uh, gay and part of the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, this would include people who are come from East Asian, South Asian, African descent. You know, it's a um, it's a division between um, those who are the oppressors and the oppressed, and this comes from uh, it's it's a uh, it's a transformation of the Marxist idea that there are the proletariat and bourgeoisie in society, uh, and you know this uh, idea, this inter intersectional idea, you know, uh, borrows from concepts like critical race uh, studies and critical race theory, uh, and the different subcomponents of critical race studies. Uh, when it comes to you know um, critical race theory um, with black people, uh, East Asian uh, discrimination, uh, you also have uh, radical fem radical feminism, uh, queer theory, and they all come together to uh, create you know this idea of intersectionality. Uh, and the idea behind diversity, equity, inclusion is to correct for the historic injustices faced by uh, black people, indigenous people, uh, queer people. Uh, the way to correct you know, these uh, historic injustices is to create policies 
uh, to diversify uh, spaces to uh, uh, create uh, uh, systems in which you know equity can be um, achieved and uh, and to create spaces that are inclusive. But I think that uh, the the underlying assumptions behind diversity, equity, and inclusion are flawed. Uh, but I think also what emerges from diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, is just uh, flawed, uh, putting it mild, mildly, and uh, you know, I think in some cases is actually appalling. So I, the idea that there that certain groups are are just inherently uh, oppressed, I think, is a, a flawed idea because um, it seeks to categorize people based on their uh, their identity. Um, I, in specific, when it comes to racial identity, uh, DEI uh, posits or uh, the ideas behind DEI posits uh, that because of the history and the, on the North American continent of slavery and uh, and the post-slavery era uh, era of uh, Jim Crow laws and uh, historic discriminate discriminatory laws like redlining laws and such, that Black people are inherently uh, oppressed and they have a harder time getting ahead uh, in society. This is what um, uh, is called systemic racism. And I think uh, that you know there it is true that you know historic um, historic injustices do affect what uh, emerges today. I think that just pointing to a, lit a litany of wickedness of the past does not necessarily determine causality. Uh, to um, yeah, it, it it doesn't prove that you know uh, the economic um, the economic situation of blacks are ought to necessarily be in a worse off position than uh, whites or just your average Canadian. And I think uh, where that underlying assumption of the oppressed and the oppressor breaks down is when you look at you know, different minority communities and the uh, educational, the uh, economic outcomes of these minority communities, and you look at their, the, the historic uh, injustices that they faced, and you see a wide diversity of outcomes. Uh, the Black community, for example, uh, in Canada, um, uh, it, it, it is assumed uh, that you know black black Canadians aren't able to get ahead uh, economically. They aren't able to um, uh, get ahead in the education system, and thus we need to uh, uh, create programs in order to create you know equity and to and uh, to uh, diversify you know the academic environment. Uh, but uh, I think that um, I think that what should be prioritized instead is the idea that there are certain prerequisites to educational success. There are certain prerequisites to uh, economic success in Canada in Canada, or just in general. And that um, teaching you know, certain skills and instilling certain values are far more important to just your inherent identity. Uh, me personally, I grew up in a household in which hard work was valued and you know, doing well in school uh, was valued. And I wasn't necessarily taught to think of myself uh, in racial terms. Now, um, that's not entirely true. My dad uh, is what I would say is a black nationalist, uh, and he does think about about himself in you know racial terms. But that wasn't necessarily emphasized in my household. And from that, I I was able to you know get good, decent enough grades in school, and I was able to you know progress through university, and I was able to you know, uh, apply and, you know, get good jobs because I met certain prerequisites to success, you know, educational success or economic success and otherwise. Uh, and I think that uh, meeting those prerequisites to success are far more important uh, to uh, getting ahead in life in whatever field you want to get ahead to, in, uh, in uh, than the, uh, pot uh, than the uh, potential for discrimination to uh, impede one's ability to um, get, a, get ahead in life. Uh, I think when you look at just the, the, the data, uh, people, Black people especially, who meet the prerequisites to success are able to uh, achieve ju just the same, uh, same level of success or even succeed or surpass the, the level of success that uh, white folks have been able to achieve. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, data- Sorry, just one minute. Okay, uh, I'll try and wrap up. If you look at uh, data, of uh, black uh, ma married couples, you find that uh, uh, black black uh, black people who are married uh, have a lo much lower likelihood of ending up in poverty than your average white person does. And the reason for that is marriage is one of the prerequisites for a long-term 
happiness and economic success. Um, I don't believe that, you know, back in, uh, or, or there's also a 19, uh, study back in 1969, which found that uh, black households in which there were a library card magazines and newspapers, uh, these uh, households did just as, just as well um, and achieved just as much economic success as uh, white families with uh, similar educational backgrounds. And I believe this is because uh, it shows that there, that even back in 1969, when there was far, far more uh, racial discrimination and uh, racism in the society, but even back in 1969, black people who were able to meet the prerequisites to success um, and you know who put an emphasis on education and learning were able to uh, achieve um, and meet and uh, you know make something of their lives. Uh, so I, I I think that just to wrap up, uh, EDI uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion are poor goals, um, and that you know we should put a far 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 greater emphasis on helping people, whether they're black, whether they're East Asian, South Asian, white, whatever, just helping people meet the prerequisite, prerequisites of success and to not think of themselves in sort of racial or identitarian, you know, uh, in, in, in that fashion, uh, because I think that creates um, not just, you know, uh, social strife, but I think that also creates a complex to where, um, you know, when people continue to think about themselves in that way, they don't, they sort of lose the motivation to uh, do well uh, in the education system or to get ahead of, in uh, life through, um, through getting a job or getting married and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, that's my spiel. Thank you. Okay, so last but not least, Dave. Good afternoon, everyone. Bon après-midi tout le monde et bonsoir tout le monde qui a nous rejoint sur, uh, en ligne. Merci d'avoir resté engagé avec nous. Thank you for remaining engaged with us to those of you joining online. So we were given some questions to address and I will touch on a few things. One, the general goals of DEI, what challenges exist, uh, where those, what discussions are taking place now. And then I'll wrap up with some of my personal thoughts on this. Like a bad book, I will give you the conclusion at the beginning and that is, do I think this thing that we call DEI is flawed or has flaws to it? Yes. What should replace it? I will admit to you, I don't know, right? And I think that's a discussion that we need to have. And I think we also have to be careful about just totally abandoning ideas and not being mindful or giving serious thought to what should or what could replace them. So when we look at what the general goals of DEI are, I always tell people it's important to have an understanding of history. Where did these things come from? Because it didn't just appear out of thin air. And so a lot of this comes from the civil rights movement in the US. And you, for those of you who may know anything about Title VII of the Civil Rights Act that you know made it illegal to discriminate on the basis of race or their um, immutable characteristics. In the Canadian context, we had the uh, Royal Commission on e Equality and Employment, and from that we had the Employment Equity Act. And if you've ever looked at the Employment Equity Act, it is very specific in scope. The act is meant to advance equity and employment for four groups, visible minorities, Aboriginal peoples, persons with disabilities, and women. In the US context, Title VII just really focuses on several immutable characteristics, the protected grounds. And we use similar language here in Canada in our human rights codes. But we also have to look at the legislative landscape that we have. So it's different in the US where everything it sits inside Title VII, but here we have several things. So we have, for example, in our constitution, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. We have the Canadian um, Bill of Rights. In our various provinces, we have our human rights codes and those look at more expansive areas. So there are far more protected grounds of discrimination than the Employment Equity Act would have looked at. If we summarize the Employment Equity Act, it only looks at disability, race, and gender, but our human rights codes and our charter protect far more than that. And then of course, here in Canada, we also have the Indian Act, which sits on very shaky territory, right? Uh, for many, we'll, many will agree it's paternalistic in nature. And of course, there is a danger in just totally repealing the Indian Act because then you may deny Indigenous peoples, particularly status Indians, of some of the benefits it was meant to confer. So it sits in shaky territory. But then we also have the Official Languages Act because that is part of the Canadian history, right? The English and the French. 
How do we make sure that we can guarantee equality between languages? And then we also have, in particular, in Quebec, la Charte de la langue française, for those who don't know, the Charter of the French language, right? That's how we've protected the French language in Quebec. And this is where Canada sits in, a, at least from my perspective, sits in an interesting place. This country is officially bilingual, but only one province is officially so. And then in our charter, one of the tenets of it, if you will, is that there is protection for minority rights. And minority rights aren't just, you know, if you look at how they write about it, it's not that it didn't encompass what we now call visible minorities, but it really looked at linguistic minorities and so forth. So there are different protections that we have to be mindful of historically. So what is this thing all meant to get at? This is why we have to look at history. And so the goals you may, you know, if, as undefined as these goals are, we may get some idea of them from the various terms that are used. And this is where I also appreciate the frustration on many who are totally against DEI or have serious concerns about it because we come up with one term and then by tomorrow we've come up with many other terms. So we have DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now we've added anti-racism, accessibility, justice, decolonization, indigeneity, indigenization, and the list goes on and on and on. And you wonder, at what point does it become too overwhelming for people to feel as though they're even making any progress? So I appreciate those concerns. Those things speak to particular things, right? They have specific goals within them, but I'm also mindful of when a problem becomes too overwhelming or too big for people, the response can actually simply be paralysis, that you actually do nothing about it at all. And I think this is where in DEI, we fail sometimes by lacking project management principles. So for the heterodox folks, you've heard me give this presentation before. So this for you is a refresher's course for those of you who don't know me, welcome to the club. The other concept too that is there is belonging and there's a professor in the US, I forget his name, I know his first name is John. He's come up with uh, another thing called targeted universalism, which it, he frames as belonging 2.0. So now when we look at what the challenges are, I, so I've alluded to some of it, it's the evolution in the terminology and that evolution in terminology, I think happens far too quickly. But I can also look at the other side and go, people are trying to better define and identify what they're up against. Because unless we have language, unless we can name an issue, we're really just grabbing at thin air. So we need language, we need to identify problems, we need to identify issues. But if we have too many things to address, then we're, then we're running into the paralysis. The same with what exactly, if you may appreciate this, what exactly does diversity mean? And organizations themselves struggle with this. None of us can really identify beyond the Employment Equity Act, for example, naming four distinct groups. Right now, the federal government is conducting a review of the Employment Equity Act. That work is being led by Professor Adele Blackett from McGill. So, of course, a lot of people are saying, well, now we need to add the 2 LGBTQ plus community, and maybe there are other communities that need to be added. But then we also look at, here in our Canadian context specifically, francophone issues, English, in, English issues, right? So we may say, for example, Quebecers feel like the minority in what we'd call the ROC, the rest of Canada. But then even within Quebec, who do we have? The English-speaking minority. So who exactly are we referring to may be a matter of context. Then if you, I wanna give you the example, look at, what, look at how our current governor general, Mary Simon has been slammed. So we're officially bilingual with respect to French and English. She's bilingual as a speaker of Inuktitut and English, but there have been hundreds if not thousands of complaints to the office of the or official language commissioner about the governor general not being officially uh, bilingual with respect to French and English. But then what place could, do we have to recognize and support indigenous languages? Is it so offensive? Should it be so wrong? That's a debate we can also have. One of the other issues is, do we have the appropriate benchmarks? And I also think this is where those who work in this field, we have it flawed. So we will do the measurements, we will collect the, demog we will collect the demographic data on what the workplace looks like, but many fail in this regard, and I still see organizations come, come up with this request. Dave, we want to collect data. What do you want to do with the data they don't know? What data do you want to collect they also don't know? But that's fine, right? When you don't know, you just don't know. And if you're open to learning, then that's good. But this is the issue. If we simply collect the data to say, okay, we have five black people here. We have one indigenous person here. Then we're not actually using the data the real way we think it should be intended. If we think that there are issues with folks who can 
coming through the talent acquisition pipeline, that's what the data should be supporting. Do we think that there are barriers with who can progress up to the top of the food chain? That's what the data is supposed to look at. Do people get different kinds of feedback in the professional development process? That's what the data should enable. The data shouldn't just be there to say, okay, we have five persons here. The other issue is just what we benchmark it against. So people don't know this. They'll say, okay, black folks in Toronto comprise 8% of the population, 3% of Canada. So which one do you use? Are we measuring against our community? Are we measuring against our city? Are we measuring against the entire country? Neither of those is actually the appropriate measure. What we should be looking at is the pool of available talent. Sorry, just one minute. How did I even get there? <laughs> but those are all the things we have to consider. We can have more discussions because I have way more points to, to, to address. But here are my personal thoughts within the minute that remains. Viewpoint diversity is still alive within this. Viewpoint diversity remains the issue that we haven't sufficiently addressed, particularly how do people who are conservative minded feel accommodated within something that feels like an entirely liberal construct, right? That is the heart of what we probably are struggling to name and we want to talk about that we haven't really hit the nail on. The other bit is that we are litigating, in my view, the past in the present. There are groups, many of them who feel unjustly treated and it hasn't been sufficiently rectified and so it's going to bear out right now and for those who are feeling some degree of injustice right now then everyone is also going to feel it too for the conservatives who don't feel as though they have a place to voice their views on campus or elsewhere that is going to come out too so that's why we now have this thing called the culture wars who is woke and who is not woke and i think we can get some knowledge from uh, African proverbs, right? The child who is not embraced will burn down the village to feel its warmth. And right now everyone is burning down the village on the left, on the right, and even in the middle. The last thing I'll say is this. One of the, I've realized, in my view at least, and this is, and I think this predates the pandemic, but the pandemic, if anything, just amplified this or made the situation worse. We do not have trust in this society or at least trust is rapidly eroding. We don't trust academics. Many of you in this room may be from the academia. People don't trust you, right? Are you trying to indoctrinate their children? Are you trying to impose? Are you really there to let different ideas flourish? During the pandemic, we've probably lost trust in our medical professionals because we felt as though, what happened to my body, my choice? What exactly does that mean? We've never really trusted our politicians, but probably even more so now, or we simply stick to the politicians that amplify or emphasize what we'd like to hear. Last but not least, as we have this discussion about EDI, people don't necessarily trust me or the work that we do. They probably never have from the beginning, even the groups that it is meant to support because that, I, that utopia, right? That Garden of Eden has really not manifested. Those are my submissions. Okay, thanks so, thanks so much, Dave. Um, so what we would do is invite um, people to come up to the microphone. If you have a question, you can literally just come up to the microphone um, and we'll probably alternate between having somebody from uh, who's here in the room and then uh, somebody online. If, um, I'm monitoring the Q&A uh, uh, for the people on Zoom. So. Don't be shy. Um, and uh, oh, we have we have a winner. Um. <laughs> and, and, and by the way, the, the heterodox folks know you can trash DEI as much as you'd like in front of me. I don't mind it. I think this is part of what we need to encourage, which is the the exchange, the respectful exchange. And then just if, when you ask questions, if there's a particular panelist that you want to respond, or but but obviously all panelists can can jump in. Um, uh, in due course. So uh, go ahead, Rachel. Is that on? I don't think so. Is it? Is it? Okay. Um, oh, I'm Rachel Altman from SFU. Um, thanks very much all for coming for your presentations. Um, so my question, I guess, is primarily for Grace, but I'm happy to hear hear your uh, the other panelists' views as well. So um, I noticed that you, you used the word safe twice in your, in, in your presentation um, in context of safe spaces and then also people uh, not necessarily feeling safe 
to express their opinions. And I've noticed that um, safe, I think, is, is a really kind of hot button word right now um, because it, it, it really lies, I think, um, or it, 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 it really makes those of us who are concerned about academic freedom very, very nervous. Um, so we already have, like, like at SFU, and I'm, I think probably elsewhere, we have strong like bullying and harassment policies. We have human rights policies. We have, um, of course, Canadian law. So those we, we are clearly protected uh, from physical violence um, and we're protected from harassment um, and, and sort of targeted uh, targeted insults, racial slurs, all that sort of stuff. Like we're clearly already protected from that. And so the question then is what does safe mean? Because it's used so much um, by EDI offices and everything and saying that we want to create a safe environment. So what does safe mean? Because it clearly means something beyond uh, physical safety or beyond safety from harassment, bullying, et cetera. Um, and uh, what is a safe space? And, and is your notion of safety um, consistent? Or is it, can, can it exist also while preserving academic freedom? Or are the two in, in inherent conflict? Oh, that's gosh. my question. And, and so just ask people to speak into the microphone okay. as much as possible, Sorry. yeah. I hope that's okay. Yeah, yeah okay. Thanks, Rachel. Um, yeah, it, it is really interesting because I also kind of feel like I subconsciously absorb that word of safe space. Um, now we're kind of playing around with the idea of brave spaces. And it is really a bit of a struggle about what on earth does this mean and why is that happening? So even though we have a lot of policies and, and we kind of deal with like the overt forms of, of exclusion, um, practices never really seem to happen. You know, there are quite a few grievances that are happening and sorry to air the dirty laundry people, um, but it's, it is a reality though. Um, so for me, safe space is something that I think can be I hope you guys, okay, uh, a little bit of a placeholder um, while we have kind of a guidance for what space, uh, safe space means, pardon me, in like the policies and definitions, but ultimately it really is up to us on how we define it and the interactions that we have with another. In terms of academic freedom and how they conflict, I am going to say it, it is kind of just an inevitability, like how, how we are going to have these issues of, um, to be honest, I don't think it's an issue personally, but having these different viewpoints, and then it's really difficult to not feel offended, right? And as if it's like a personal attack. And so I think that's where the idea of safe space kind of happened. It's kind of like the ground rules for your feelings, if that kind of makes sense, which is a very odd concept or a, an odd way to perform, if that also makes sense. Um, but that's kind of where I'm coming from. <laughs> So, so sorry, are you saying that you think it can be possible to have a safe space where people aren't offended, even no. in a unit? Oh, maybe I misunderstood what you meant. No, no, I, I feel like it's one of those things where it, it will be inherently con conflictual. I, I think no matter how wonderful our goals might be in terms of how we can define EDI, create spaces, or, or whatever it is that we're trying to accomplish, our 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 sensitivities, I guess, our, our understanding, our experiences will always still be a really large part of how we view everything, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say probably, I'm not quite sure, but mostly no. <laughs> no. no uh, I, no, it, it'll be a conflict, I think. So does that mean we shouldn't have safe spaces there? Oh, no, I think we should. I think we're always going to be working towards it. It's just going to be difficult for us to truly feel as if we're listened to. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, but then that means violation of academic freedom. Yeah, I know. That's the that's the issue right there. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> it's a little okay. conflict. A conflict. Yeah. Um, no. No? And just use the microphone as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, cool. Um so yeah, I mean, uh my, my approach to safe space is, is like, you know, we should uh, seek to make make our common spaces as safe as possible, you know, whether that be safe from violence or safe safe from hatred and mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't think, you know, sort of like retreating into our own, you know, sort of safe spaces is like, um, it, it is a good idea. Safe spaces based on, say, uh, your racial identity or, you know, your, um, your identity as a member of the LGBTQ community. I, I don't think that, you know, sort of retreating from, you know, the, the rest of society into the, you know, these, you know, sort of defined groups that, you know, are sort of segregated from the rest of society, quite frankly, is a good idea. I think that, you know, when you 
se- you know, when you have groups that are segregated from the rest of society, it makes it easier to sort of other, you know, the rest of society and, uh, and other other people. I think, you know, when it, on, in the certain, from the racial perspective, you know, if you sort of create these, you know, black only spaces or these like, you know, really race specific, eth- ethnicity specific, you know, spaces, I think that can be a, fo- a place where ethno-nationalism is fostered and, you know, nationalism, ethno-nationalism, I think, you know, there, if there's a healthy amount of it, like say, you know, Italian pride or black pride, I think there's nothing wrong with that, um, you know, having pride in your ethnicity, but when it sort of gets like this, you know, really rabid, you know, nationalism, there's this tendency to sort of, you know, sort of self, you know, project, you know, certain like positive attributes onto your, onto a community uh, that, you know, you may think that, you know, other, you know, communities or other or different ethnicities don't have, or, and you can also take it, uh, take national, uh, ethno-national from the perspective of like uh, being in opposition to something. Uh, and I think a lot of, uh, you know, DEI adjacent, you know, programs and, uh, and, and events and stuff like that are sort of not necessarily uh, geared to fostering sort of, you know, internal uh, positive, you know, a feeling. I think, you know, a lot of it is geared to uh, toward uh, othering, you know, other groups. I think, you know, uh, the idea of the straight white male is, you know, this like really easy, you know, like straw man sort of, you know, thing that, you know, you know a lot of people could, could just attack, you know, because, you know, they have like all of the uh, intersectional historic bag- baggage from, you know, the colonial past and, you know, uh, being oppressors to the LGBT community historically and um, and whatnot. So, you know, I, I don't think that, you know, creating these like, you know, sort of segregated safe spaces is, is a good idea. I think, you know, you can foster a lot of negative ideas. And I think, you know, it's just exclusionary. It's inherently exclusionary. It's, you know, op- opposite to, you know, the goals of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, and you have, you know, a lot of uh, examples of this. Uh, you know, for example, the University of Guelph, they had a, a sexual embodiment workshop that uh, only people who identified as LGBTQ and Black, Indigenous, or a person of color could attend. You know, so I couldn't attend because even though I'm Black, I'm not a member of the LGBTQ community. And there's, you know, adva- uh, programs like McMaster, uh, where um, certain staff uh, members uh, were able to attend based on their racial, att- uh, racial identity of being Black, Indigenous, or racialized. Uh, and, you know, non-white employees were, weren't allowed to attend, you know, and the event was for the purpose for non-white employees to interact with one, each other, one another and get to know each other. And I, I don't think, you know, that's necessarily productive in any way. I actually think that's, you know, very divisive and, you know, mm-hmm. exclusionary. Thanks. Anyone have a question? We'll go to Tanya and then Sonia. Sure. Oh, Sonia, you were first. Oh, okay. 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 Um, I don't think safe spaces have a safe space in formal academic environments. Um, clubs, uh, rooms, sure. Classes, conferences, any formalized spaces. I don't think you can be safe from offense. You can be safe from from um, difficult ideas. So I, I think that having a safe space uh, it, it is antithetical to having academic freedom within the confines of a formal academic environment. Um, and I think the idea of being safe is sort of, again, uh, similar to the, 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 the understanding is similar to words like harm and violence. Those are words that really don't have any coherent definition the way that they're used in in uh, uh, sort of EDI environments or in the cultural wars. Um, and so we we I, I've been I've been in a meeting where someone characterized a debate about uh, academic freedom as bringing harm to that person. <laughs> And this is an administrator, a PhD, a 40 something year old. So I'm not exactly sure how we can, we can truly have academic freedom if people are that fragile. Mm-hmm. Um, so 
it, it's it's something to think about. Like I said, you could have spaces in on campus where that are again single sex or gar- geared towards certain individuals, as long as those spaces are not paid for by the university. Uh, any any space paid for by the university should be by definition inclusive. Um, and and so yeah, I I don't think I don't think safe spaces in the way that they are understood are, are compatible with with academic freedom. Thanks, uh, Tani. It's um so I'm my title at work is arbiter of student issues, <clears throat> which is like akin to an ombudsperson. So. Uh, my constituency group is students who have complaints. So the first, the first conversation that I have with my student complainants is what you're describing is hurt as opposed to harm. Mm-hmm. And so that first discussion that I have with them is you have a particular constellation of, of needs and um, tolerances that you know are personal to you, which the college does not need to accede to, right? So now, as you were saying, it's Rachel, right? As you were saying, if it's harm, that's a different story, right? Mm -hmm. So if the instructor, the faculty member has harmed you by being racist, right, whether overtly or covertly, et cetera, that's a different kettle of fish, right? Mm -hmm. That is for me what defines needing a safe space. So it, in the classroom, I don't want to tamper academic thought. I don't want to tamper um, conflicting ideas. I do want to tamper harm. And as you said, we already have those tools, mm-hmm. right? We've got BC Human Rights Codes. We've got legislation. We've got policies at our institutions that protect us from that. And so I think where safe spaces were born, it primarily meant to decrease that harm that may have been going on. I think back to my university years, and you know, if you were a tenured prof, you could say whatever you wanted to the student, regardless of whether it was overtly racist, you were not getting fired. Mm-hmm. So we've traveled a distance, right? So there may have been a time where a safe space was useful in the classroom to ensure that there was no harm coming to the students. But I think now, as you're saying, Grace, we do need to move into that brave space where the space that we're talking about, where it's safe, it's actually safe to have conflicting ideas. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's in the moment in time where we need to move to. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for that. Thanks, guys. And it's also just having basic human respect for one another more than anything else. And and whatever language it is that we use in any situation that might be necessary. Um, for example, I've heard of stories in of uh, um, meetings where um, people would say a lot of derogatory um, slurs, racial slurs, and stereotypes and everything else. And so what is happening? What, like, how have we come to this extent or, you know, that we need these? Mm-hmm. We also have like respectful workplace guidelines. So mm-hmm. this is why we have so many mm-hmm. guidelines in place. That's why, and and interestingly, like the word safe though seems to be used more today than I remember it being used say 10 years ago uh, or longer. So it seems like it's more of a new concept. Um, and yet I've never seen it defined. Like what, what does it mean beyond beyond any of these, um, the, the harms like that, that, that you described him, like, uh, you know, it's, it's not clearly defined and it's very, it's, I just want to point, it's very concerning, like to hear that word when it's not defined, when it, uh, especially for those of us who care deeply about academic freedom. So yeah, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Dave, did you want to respond? Yeah, it, it wasn't posed to me, but I will do like everyone. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, bring the microphone. Uh, sure. Thanks. Yeah. You know, one of the, I think one of the concerns with safe spaces is that it, it only breeds conformity or that it only supports conformity and that everyone must be of the same mind. Um, I would agree with you what exactly constitutes harm is undefined, uh, especially when people say they want that. I think from what I understand, the harm may be, you know, they don't want to have to 
explain or describe or justify the discriminatory experiences they may have had or may not have had. Not trying to necessarily defend it, but that may be what some use it for. But with respect to whether only conformity or single-mindedness of view exists in those spaces and where viewpoint diversity is concerned, I would tell you, I, I don't think they, I don't think viewpoint diversity doesn't happen in those in those community in those environments. If I take, for example, the black community, we disagree on a whole bunch of things. I, as you probably heard in my bio, I'm clearly actively involved in policing reform. What do you hear from some? From some, defund, disarm, dismantle, and abolish the police. So there are some who will be comfortable with the idea that we can reform policing, and there are some who say we need to totally do away with the institution that is policing. There will be different perspectives as to whether some of us, like myself, are playing respectability politics, or do we, are we radical enough to advance the change that is necessary? I think back to when Black Lives Matter Toronto um, held up the Pride Parade, and they were confronted now with this issue of, are you going to allow the police to participate in future years? And now the gay community there is still grappling with this question of, can the police march this year or not? So even within those communities or the communities that are gathered on a particular identity, there are many issues on which they're going to differ, many things on which they don't necessarily share the same perspectives. So maybe in my view, I don't even know if safe spaces have ever really existed, right? All it may seem to do is you may just not be able to share what you may want to share in that moment, but it doesn't mean that you walk out of it not having a totally different viewpoint, a totally different perspective on the issue. And it goes back to, you know, we have to be careful. As I said, if I look at the, the defunding the police thing, for those who say get rid of it, those of us who say we can fix it, you get rid of it, then what may come in its place? And being careful of those unintended consequences. The Brave Spaces thing, I think, I don't know if it comes from Mickey Scott Bay Jones, but she has a poem called Invitation to Brave Space. Whenever I'm facilitating a session, I'll recite that one because I'll tell them, you can challenge me and you should be free to challenge everyone else in the room because what we want to do is create a learning environment. If you think you have to come in and simply tell me what I want to hear, I don't know if we're going to get where we want to, to get to, but the last thing, I think this is the bigger issue with DEI and, and how some folks practice it, and this doesn't tie to safe space per se, but it's just a broad observation. We are trying ever so much to change the individual, and I don't, I don't think we've appreciated enough that we can't. You can't change someone unless they really want to. You can't help someone who doesn't want your help unless they're willing to invite it or have you give it to them. So what we can work on are the systems, right? And Yes, we can have a discussion about what are the systems, right? We always say the system is against me or the system is holding me down. We can talk about that too. Thank you. So, sorry, we're just going to go to a question from the um, the online people. Um, so, I'm just going to sort of summarize this question, but basically, it gets to um, uh, thinking about the universities as places of education. Um, you know, that's sort of been the the primary historical function, um, but maybe that is perhaps buckling under EDI concerns um, and, you know, other, other things like, you know, offices of student mental health. Um, so I guess the question is, um, where is sort of education in terms of the context of the modern university? Um, and it's not uh, put at any particular panelist, so anybody can, uh, can respond to that uh, question. So where, where is education? Yeah, so so I, I think, you know, sort of thinking about maybe the conf perhaps conflicting um, goals of, you know, ed education being the historical goal of universities, you know, is that being impacted by um, EDI and other sort of offices uh, on campus? I think that that's one of the systems we're trying to change. So... Um, I think it's problematic if you've got curriculum that do is donkey's years old, um, that doesn't reflect the makeup of the class itself. So that's where EDI is going to intersect, if you will, with the classical education, you know, what, 
what colleges and universities were meant to do was to educate. But um, that's based on a very colonial, you know, a particular way of knowing and being and, and a particular way of learning. And so I think there is space to have that discussion as to whether or not, it, of course, post-secondary institutions are about teaching, right? That's, it's about the, the marketplace of ideas and exchanging information. But I think what you want to not lose sight of is that there is a place for EDI to make its mark on traditional education. There is a reason why classrooms have been filled with particular people as opposed to not particular people. And so when you look at developing curriculum, perhaps you include those stories of a broader set of the society that can access the college and university. So in that respect, do I think that EDI is sort of, you know, post-secondary institutions are traditional places of learning. That, that's why they're there. We're, we're not a social work service. We're not, you know, we're not a counseling service. These are allied supports. They're not supposed to be central. The central piece of a post-secondary institution is to teach material so that the student can engage in that learning with the instructor um, and research and all of that valuable stuff. But does that in and of itself, that's still the core business of education, but does that fact in and of itself exclude the impact that equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, can have on what we teach and how we teach it and who we're letting into the academy? So that's how I see it uh, coming together. Thanks. And by, by all means, we don't, not every panelist has to respond, but, you know, if we can leave that open if, if anyone else wants to respond. Two, two things come, come to mind for, for me very quickly. And I think we've seen this hot button issue. Can you use the N-word in the classroom? Right? And it, uh, Lord. So my general disposition, I will tell you, is a word like that, it's dead and really has no place around. But might you use it in context? that discussion can be had. And I you know, always go back to what is the context in which it wants to be used. And I, I find it unfortunate that professors, for example, have had their lives blown up and branded racist just because they used it or they quoted it. Most, most recently is, I think, um, an executive in HR from the city of Markham who was teaching a class at George Brown and she was just quoting or reciting a, a situation and she used it. And now she's been put on suspension. And I go, would I necessarily want that to happen? And then here's what happens as in the result as of you know, the bigger picture. People are gonna look at it and go, there go the black people being sensitive. But is it necessarily the black people that are being sensitive? Sometimes it's everyone else trying to feel sensitive for us. So we have to be careful about that too, when we look at the aftermath. But it doesn't mean the black perspective on that should be ignored or that there isn't a Black perspective on it. Quite frankly, Black perspectives are split. There's some who are quite comfortable using it. You hear it a lot in rap music, right? In music, or even TV scripts will still use it. And it becomes odd. You know, I look at the practical effects. So this is, some, this is law language, practical effects. I, I say to people, so you have this song. Everybody except the Black people are going to use this one word when you get to that one point. <laughs> How does this work? How does this work? Interestingly enough, if you look at some of the history, the NAACP in the US, so the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, they had a funeral to bury the N-word. And that's my disposition on it. But again, a situation like that falls on it, it will fall on individual, personal politics, the comfort with, with which to use it or whether you think there's any need for it. But we're seeing this phenomenon of reclamation. So people taking back these words, so they came out of very nasty, negative, discriminatory places, so you have the N word for the black community, you have the F word in the gay community, you have the B word for women, right? And it goes on and on and on and on. And people are taking it back. Jew and Jewish, for example, and people don't know is at one point, Jewish was the bad word, but now Jewish is the word we use. So this is why I always say context and history have to always be so important for us to understand how we change and go through things, right? Because at one point it was the Israelite, the Hebrews, and it went through changes. 
The same way with referencing the black community, terms of reference have changed. So that's one. The other, I look at, so I, I, if I look at my, my law school education right now, we, in our first year, we have to take what is called indigenous and Aboriginal law. Now I think it's interesting because as you may have heard from Kalev and Dov this morning, and, I, and, I, and I've always, I actually always use her, their article about why diversity programs still when I'm teaching. The DEI stuff, how we do education, the training sessions, if we make them mandatory, that's when we start to produce negative effects. People need a choice as whether they come in or not. So I never make it, if anyone is coming to a presentation, I'm giving all this to the employers, this can't be mandatory for your staff. I want them to have a choice. And even when I was doing it at work, I made sure you had a choice. In the law school curriculum, because it's a mandatory course, there is no choice. But I think it is done in a manner that is interesting and probably maybe more effective because it just looks and reads as law. Just as how we have tort law, contracts law, constitutional law, administrative and regulatory law, there's just indigenous law, indigenous and Aboriginal law. And we're getting this blend of what we're used to as the common law and the civil law. And we're going, okay, this is what it looks like from the indigenous perspective, or at least here are the laws that you've applied to indigenous peoples from our typical lens. And that's how we can make this stuff blend, I, you know? We have to get outside of the habit of seeing these things as always in conflict or antithetical to each other. Sometimes they may be, sometimes they're not. We just have to go back to context and purpose. Thank you. Any other panelists or should we move on? All right, we're gonna move on to uh, Alexandra. <clears throat> Hello, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for organizing this wonderful event. Um, it's a lot to learn. Um, so my so my question is um, is about the goal of the EDI at the universities, and there will be a specific question. So I am an immigrant, um, first generation immigrant to this country, uh, from uh, former Soviet Union, and um, as many of us, um, so we came to this country just because we wanted to um, escape our unfree country. Uh, I'm from Russia and um, uh, the country where increasingly uh, there is a politicization of thought, there is a punishment for thinking, for diversity of opinions. So uh, we came here uh, leaving everything behind. So really paying the price for being immigrants. So, um, and now we, in, in the past years, uh, we've becoming increasingly concerned. And that's exactly about what's happening about the EDI infrastructure and bureaucracy. So uh, in the first years of me immigrating here in 2010, like Sonia, um, it felt great just because you can express yourself, you can express your opinion. Uh, nobody's policing your thought. Nobody is policing your language. It's, it's absolute con contrast with my country. But now in the past several years, it's becoming very, very concerning. Uh, it started to remind me a little bit of my country now. So just because the university where I was, that we had a huge bureaucracy. So there was no money enough for the faculty. There was a huge bureaucracy. And there were all these people, they will decide on you know, the course of the university. Now it's getting worse. So, and I'm seeing right now that what's happening with the EDI is just, <clears throat> as people discussed on this forum here, it's not really well defined. People still cannot agree on the definitions, what they're doing. However, some feel very strongly about change in hearts and minds or change in behavior. And that's a very dangerous path. When people and my colleagues right now expressing the opinion that <clears throat> I'm afraid I'm teaching my syllabus to something very boring, I'm not discussing anything substantial in the course because I'm afraid students will complain. They will not like this. They will be afraid about the term. That's very dangerous path. And this is, you know, it's like a way, it's a, there is a great, great expression, uh, path to hell is paved with great intentions. So any ideology has wonderful goals in mind. Even now the war in Ukraine is for peace, if you, if you know about it. It's all about peace and bringing peace to the world. So what I'm worried about and my question is, how do you actually um, respond to the concerns that we immigrants uh, to this country, already citizens here, have about the growing bureaucracy of EDI, of more, more constraints on the uh, uh, freedom of thought, of freedom of expression at the universities. Uh, where do you see it going actually? And if you really think that will help with the academic mission of the university and the future of this great country. Thank you. Uh, Noah? Who did you direct it at? 
Uh, you actually, said it was I'm, going to be well, it, it, some people I agree with, and some people actually, I'm, I'm very concerned because I'm hearing change in minds and hearts or behavior. That's right. that's what I would like to hear more. How do you respond to our concerns? Yeah, uh, I think you know you have a good reason to be concerned. Um, you know, when you have examples of, for example, the uh, w whether you love him or hate him, uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson, uh, yeah, he has a something going on with the Ontario College of Psychologists where. Um, Long story short, uh, they weren't happy with some of his tweets and public comments, and then and they're trying to, I believe, uh, strip him of his uh, license to practice. Um, and then you have a lot of other, you know, college college boards of, you know, say, uh, teachers or psychologists or whatnot, who believe that they have the authority to police what you know the these professionals say outside of their professional uh, pursuit. Uh, and, and I think, you know, that's, you know, it's quite, da it's quite dangerous. Uh, you also have uh, corporations that, you know, in their pursuit to achieve diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, they force uh, their, you know, employees, uh, and this all, also happens uh, in academic institutions, they force uh, employees to sign off uh, to a diversity, equity, and inclusion statement, uh, where they have to affirm their belief in certain in, the, in these values. And I, I don't think you, you should ha be forced to, you know, affirm uh, your belief into, in, in something you don't believe. You know, I, I think, um, I remember reading the Gulag Archipelago yeah. and um, and they would have uh, people who were arrested for no good reason having to confess uh, to the, these you know, crimes that, you know, they, they didn't perpetrate. And, you know, if, unless they, you know, signed off to their confession, they would be subjected to, you know, vigorous torture. Now, I'm not saying any anything close to that is happening in Canada, but I'm, I'm just saying, you know, it's like a, like a, like a very watered down version of that, you know, it, it, you have to agree with, uh, you know, the dictates of, you know, the administration, uh, or else you'll have your professional license stripped from you, or you'll be fired, or you'll be publicly condemned. Uh, but, you know, you could avoid all of that punishment you know, just by uh, agreeing and capitulating, uh, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, it's, it's very dangerous and you know, it's sort of antithetical to the, the idea of uh, inclusion and uh, diversity. You know, there's uh, not much room for diversity uh, of, of opinion and inclusion of, you know, diverse uh, thought, uh, thoughts and uh, ideologies and ways of thinking. Uh, so yeah, there, there's definitely a great cause for concern. Uh, but I think, you know, there is a backlash uh, to, you know, um, pe people people uh, being uh, sort of canceled in that way. I kind of, I hate that word, but, you know, people being, you know, sort of canceled and sort of being, you know, stripped of, of their licensure, there there has been some backlash. And I think there, there has to be, you know, uh, that sort of backlash to, you know, thought conformity. Uh, people have to, you know, speak out and say, you know, hey, I, I might not, I might even not agree with what this guy says. But I agree, or I think that he should be able to say it. You know, I, I think there needs to be a lot more courage from you know people on both sides of the aisle. You know, whether you're left wing or right wing. You know, but, but just going out there and you know seeing an incident in which you know you think someone's thoughts and you know speech is being policed, and going out there and supporting that person. Um, you know, whether or not you agree with them politically or not. Uh, so yeah, there is definitely cause for concern, but I think there is uh, optimism. Um, <laughs> sorry, I just, I'm probably going to agree with you or you're going to agree with me. Um, so I, about 30 something percent of Canadian university students are international. Um, and of that, the majority come from uh, China and India. And then you have others sprinkled from around the world, especially third world countries. Um, in terms of the black population, it, the, the highest number come from Nigeria, so about 3%. Uh, so we're seeing that a lot of the countries that students come from, international students come from, are, are not necessarily shining examples of liberalism. And we come here and we, for the first time experience what true freedom feels like. I came to Canada in 2010 and I was a social conservative. By the time I was through with my first degree, 
I became a left-leaning um, sort of uh, Marxist identifying feminist. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm nowhere near that. But I was, I'm, I'm able to get to where I am today as a proud classical liberal because I had the space, the intellectual space to grow. But I don't see that being the case for someone who just arrives to Canada in 2023. There's a lot more restrictions in what you can learn, what you can talk about, what you can, what you can explore, what you can research. Um, and, and that doesn't help anyone. It's very interesting that if I say something that's not lock and step with the current uh, uh, understanding of gender and gender identity, I will have a mob at my door tomorrow. But if I go back to Nigeria and say that same thing, no one's going to care, even though Nigeria is not necessarily the freest place to say anything you want. So it's kind of interesting the way that um, uh, discourse has evolved in so-called liberal societies in 2023 that a lot of illiberal places are somewhat liberal <laughs> in comparison. Um, so we need to get to a point where universities are really true spaces of inquiry, of learning, of teaching without restrictions, reasonable, uh, reasonably speaking. Um, and, and so I, I, in, in, I, I, when I teach my classes, I tend to tell students that I'm a near free speech absolutist, meaning that you can say pretty much whatever you want to say in a classroom. It wouldn't offend me. Now, it might offend some people, but I always say that uh, as long as ideas are presented with reasoning, with sound reasoning and, and good evidence, you can say whatever it is that you want to say in my classes. Um, and that's the kind of environments that I want to see, uh, whether at SFU, UBC, whatever, whatever university in, in Canada. I, I don't think we shouldn't have a situation like Hamline University in the United States where a professor really uh, had to get suspended because she showed a, 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 an image of Muhammad. Right? You shouldn't have to get suspended as we had in UBC where a professor was suspended because he talked about race and IQ. So these are these are things that within the confines of the university are supposed we're supposed to be able to talk about these ideas. It's very interesting how we can talk about intelligent design and creationism today, and we can't really talk about any other thing. So I guess I don't even know where I was going with this, but <laughs> I guess the situation right now is is indeed uh, uh, a, a lot more constricting. Uh, than it has been in the past in liberal societies. Um, any, anyone else from the panel? Okay, uh, we'll move to a question from online. Um, so just again, to sort of summarize the question, um, you know, sort of has EDI um, kind of become loaded um, and is is there, is it a good idea to perhaps start from as a as a blank slate and try to use other terms that are not so loaded um, to help sort of navigate and kind of move forward? Um, so again, no particular panelist, but that's the question. This can be very short and sweet, but I'm actually tired of talking about the language of it. I think that that's one of the red herrings, right? So. Um, we get stalled at talking about the language of it. Um, you see this in you know, pretty much every equity deserving group out there. Um, and then we can't actually get to the action of it. So I would prefer not to, you know, EDI, of course it's loaded now. I would prefer not to search for another term to replace it because that just stymies the work that needs to be done. Okay. Anyone else? I think we should focus on action. Words are going to be inherently political or politicized. That's just the nature of things. We should instead focus on what is happening, uh, what outcomes are we looking for in the society, uh, and what is what is either hindering, what actions are hindering those outcomes, or what actions are helping those outcomes. I don't think 
we have a lot of words already. Like we we have EDI, we have JEDI, we have DI, we have today we, we heard about merit fairness and quality. People are not going to agree when it comes to words. We should just, I think, in my opinion, we should focus more on actions. Thanks. Uh, no? Yeah. Um, I'm going to butcher this quote, but Thomas Hobbes basically said that, you know, words are a wise man's uh, basically a tool, but they're the money of fools. Uh, I, I, I think that, you know, DEI, um, it's not necessarily that the term is, you know, just, uh, you know, loaded. I, I think that the presumptions behind DEI are just fundamentally flawed. Uh, so it's not just the term itself that I have a problem with. Um, I think that, you know, the idea that, you know, you, know, you can just identify a person based on, you know, some uh, racial characteristics, uh, characteristics or, or, or otherwise, and you can determine whether or not they've, you know, faced, um, you know, discrimination or, or are oppressed or, or an oppressor in society, I think is just a fun fundamentally flawed you know, way of perceiving human behavior and just like how uh, humans are able to, uh, or how humans I interact with uh, each other and how people are able to get ahead uh, in life uh, through economic, socially, or otherwise. Uh, I think that just the presumptions are flawed and instead of, you know, seeking, uh, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, I think instead we should be helping people you know, meeting the prerequisites to success and success in in whatever venue that you know they they determine they want to be successful in. You know, if you know someone wants to be uh, a successful uh, basketball player, or if you believe that you know, say, uh, there needs to be more uh, in, uh, in, um, more of an X group in you know, say, the basketball playing basketball. Uh, I don't think that you know just uh, bringing players on to the team based on you know diversity, equity, inclusion, based on you know the color of their skin is necessarily how you get uh, these people involved. It's, you know, sort of teaching them uh, what are the, you know, the prerequisites to success, uh, you know, to being a good basketball player. And that is, you know, to be able to shoot, dribble and pass, you know, when it comes to, you know, economic success or academic success, there's far more uh, prerequisites to success and it's far more complicated. But I think the same concept applies, you know, if you want, you know, to, alleviate certain inequalities uh, between, you know, blacks and whites, uh, you know, in uh, ec economic um, or in, in income or, you know, educational outcomes. I don't believe that, you know, sort of just uh, bringing people in uh, is uh, based on their racial characteristics is how you are to resolve that problem. I think instead it's, you know, teaching and, uh, you know, acquiring skills and, you know, meeting the prerequisites to success. And therefore you would be able to put yourself in a position to be included in uh, certain uh, spaces, you know, because I averaged a certain, uh, I had a certain average in high school and because, you know, I, I, I completed my volunteer hours, I was able to, um, uh, I was able to, you know, get admission into university. Those were the prerequisites to success, you know, to getting into university. And you can, you know, go into more detail into like what do you need to do to uh, achieve, you know, a certain average, you know, it's like hard work and study and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, so that's just my long-winded way of saying, I don't think it's necessarily the term DEI that is loaded. I think it's the presumptions behind DEI that are flawed that need to be changed. Thanks, Noah. And you know what? It's funny that you talked about assumptions because um, even before the panel started, um, we were Noah was like, you know, uh, you're going to change your mind, and I'm like, oh well, <laughs> no, we're not here to change minds. It's just I just want to have a conversation, and I just want to listen. And so um, for me, yes, I agree. Words are very political because we ourselves are political, and our and our understanding and our experience is so political. And so action is needed, but even that's never gonna be perfect. I don't think we need to reach um, the the euph euphoria. We just need to try something and see what works and what doesn't work. And it will always change no matter what, um, however, and I hate using the term pivot, um, <laughs> but however it is that we need to pivot, I think it's a great place to start. Even just having these conversations, you know, something is better than nothing. <laughs> A very brief ad. Um, so I I have a bias for action like the rest, but I can also appreciate what the person who posed the question is getting at, because you really can't get to the actions unless you've identified what it is we've all agreed to work on to address, right? So I I don't want to dismiss the, and I don't think they were dismissing, just to be clear, but I would want to dismiss the importance that words have in this, because again, 
we use so many words and you heard me list quite a few at the start and they all mean something different. So act the actions that support that objective, that goal should be different, right? If we're working towards equality is very different than if we're working towards equity. If we're making actions that are in the direction of inclusion, they're very different than actions that are in the direction of diversity. So all of, so the words do matter. And I can tell you folks, if you read any court judgment, if a word is at issue, it takes up quite a bit of the judgment. The, the little, you know, we've always heard, don't, work, don't sweat the small stuff until we do the big stuff. And then we realize, ooh, we should have spent some time on the small stuff. <laughs> and we end up having to come back to basics. And it's because we never agreed on what these words really mean. And we added more of them. What are we doing right now? Trying to figure out what we meant with the first word. So we have to be very careful. Uh, Tammy? Yeah, I just, I just want to respond to that. So um, let's take people with disabilities, pr primarily physical disabilities. So here's, you know, one of the talks that I have. So uh, in the beginning, uh, there was the word, um, and then there was light, and then there was, let me see, how does it go? I always get the, the order mixed up. There was... Um, and the word was with God. Cripple. <laughs> there was cripple. Then there was invalid. Then there was handicapped. Then there was physically challenged. Then there was disabled. Then there was person with a disability. And who the hell knows what the next iteration is. I know my community at, at the college is struggling with the next iteration as we speak. But I'm going to tell you, none of that matters. What matters is back in the 60s, I would not have access to a university. But in the 90s, I did. Why? Because there were ramps, there were rescheduling classes so that you could actually access the class with a wheelchair. That's the action I'm talking about. You can go ahead and refer to me as a crip. You can go to as an invalid. You knock yourself out. I couldn't give a rat's ass. What I care about is that now I can get into buildings. Whereas back in the 60s, you could not. So words really at bottom become meaningless. It's the actions. And I would venture to say that if we hadn't spent so much time on whether the person with a disability is a cripple or an invalid or a, a person with a disability or a person who's physically challenged, et cetera, et cetera, and spent more time on, you know, let's just, let's just make buildings with access for wheelchairs we'd be a lot further along. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna to go to a question from the audience. Go ahead. Um, yeah, thanks Thanks for coming out. This is a really interesting conversation. I was really happy with the uh, difference of opinion. Um, I'm, I'm with you guys. Like, I think any reasonable person thinks that you shouldn't face discrimination based on like some arbitrary identity category or like physical disability. I think we're all in agreement on that. Um, and the equity, the thrust of equity for that, I support. The issue is, is that there's so much um, baggage along in the equity movement that I basically see it as a Trojan horse for something else entirely. Um, so I guess from my personal life, I, I don't know where you guys are in the crowd, but um, all of my friends in university just shut their mouths. Like they just write like all these fake assignments for these fucking profs who like you know oh let's do a queer reading of frankenstein and like if you don't do the thing you don't get the grade and it's it's lunacy it's insane and my parents like i've kind of been going through this for like four years five years i, I did physics so i was um i missed all this crazy praise in the arts basically but all my friends in the arts it's it's ideological capture entirely and it scares the fuck out of me um I see it mirrored in legislation. This is this is the most engaged audience in a city of two and a half million people. How many people know about Bill C-67 in Ontario? Like seriously, raise your hand if you've heard of it. 
So one, two, three, four kind of people. It's total capture of the entire Ontario educational system to anti-racism. Bill C-67, look it up. Laura May Lindo, she's the MVP for Kitchener Centre. She put a private member's bill. It's one vote from passing. And it's going to capture the entire Ontario educational system. It's primary through university. All publicly funded schools are now going to be mandated to teach anti-racism in every school. Teachers are going to be required to go through um, examinations to prove, have a proven commitment to anti-racism. You can read this stuff on the bill. This is lunacy. How many people have heard about um, Bill 224 in BC, Anti-Racism Data Collection Act? It passed uh, about a year ago. Um, and they're collecting all racial, gender, and you know identity categories um, in all public sectors. It's now being expanded to private sectors. So if you're an employer, you're now going to be mandated when this bill passed to pass all that um, identity data again. Like, do we really think that's not going to be weaponized against employers? Oh, I don't like that pipeline. You don't have the right, you know, equity or whatever. Like, the other one is the Alberta Society uh, for Path the Alberta Law Society PATH training. Have any of you heard of this? It's, it's So it's mandatory training for all practicing Ontario Alberta lawyers. It's about 10,000 of them. And it's mandatory indigeneity training, which is it's just like the same like woke um, postmodern. Indigeneity doesn't see um, hierarchies or whatever. Like they're not chiefs. Oh, and you don't categorize things. Like indigenous ways of knowing are different. They're not like categories of different like plants and animals. Like it's all just, it's using, it's using, um, basically indigeneity or like um, African-American culture is a Trojan horse to shilling other values, which are primarily a pastiche of what we said here, which is critical theory and uh, kingdom franchise and intersectionality, which is a, a combination, if you read um, Mapping Margins, which is a paper, which has 27,000 citations, which is like more, <laughs> it's orders of magnitude more than any academic will ever get in their lifetime. Anyway, these people, Critical theorists. So I'm talking about um, Henry Giroux, who's so, sorry, I'm you can uh, didn't get to a question. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, sorry. I I can hear your frustration, mm -hmm. but we can't. What are we going to do if people like Jonathan Haidt just step down? Like we we all know Jonathan Haidt is he's he's stepping down because they're fucking mandating him to use this anti-racism stuff. I think this country is going down the drain. Basically, I, I look at these. I look at these bills, and this is authoritarian to the core. Every, everything that I can feel tells me that. And I'm. I'm. I don't want my kids to go to these schools. I don't want to lose my kids to this lunacy ideology. So, like, I guess to the two ladies at the edge of the table, what do you think? How would you explain? If what I'm claiming isn't true, how would you explain the Maoist struggle sessions against Nicholas Christakis at Yale, Brett Weinstein at Evergreen, or Lindsay Shepard at uh, Wolf Laurier? And then to you guys, what do you understand of the distal roots and purpose? Because I don't think that this is arbitrary. I don't think that the assumptions of intersectionality are wrong. I think that they're actually intentional. And if you read Herbert Marcuse's 1969 essay on liberation, it says right there in like the third paragraph that the whole goal is to use um, minorities, ethnic, sexual, and um, like women, homo homosexuals, and black people as revolutionary energy to replace the, um, the proletariat in a new Marxist revolution. He says that outright and it's- Okay, all right. I guess to you two, what, what do you make of the three cancellations that I cited? I'm sorry, I don't know enough about those situations to answer your question. I apologize. Yeah, it's under but, right. Yeah. But I, I think I think, you know, what I'm what I'm trying to get at is that there has to be a recognition that privilege is what ha these these, you know, systems that we keep talking about, the systems have embedded in them certain privileges to certain members of our society. And if we don't examine that privilege, and privilege could be for people without disabilities, it could be for white people, it could be for males, it could be for rich people. I mean, there's there's different levels of privilege and in all intersectional, uh, intersectionality of those types of privileges. 
But I think it's naive to think that if we don't have space in a fair and just society for discussion about how these systems themselves have privileged certain stratas of our community, then how do we make space for those that haven't been privileged? So Noah keeps referring to, you know, meeting the prerequisites of success. Well, there's a whole history of privilege around meeting those prerequisites of success. It's not an even playing field. You can't just assume that somebody who's got uh, the I agree with you. I'm not yeah. with you. I'm just... So, so I, I think, you know, I, my frustration is twofold: is that there, there's been as there, we're, we're just all talk, like you know, public post secondaries are all talk about EDI, you know, rainbows on on walls and flags going up the flagpole and whatnot. Um, okay, they have to be the political animals. Um, they have to demonstrate that they're doing something, I guess. So a frustration is that we're not moving to actually undoing the structures that cause uh, disruption in underprivileged uh, individuals. We're not, we're not undoing the structures themselves that are allowing for people who have um, equity, diversity, and inclusion situations that have prevented them from accessing success. We're not moving to action to, to undo those structures. So that's my one frustration on, on the one end. My other frustration is that not everything needs to be colored by EDI. So as Sonia put it, you know, science is science. Not everything needs to be colored by equity, diversity, inclusion, indigenization, and decolonization. So, you know, I am a firm believer that there should be space for a marketplace of ideas. And I think that any classroom, um, as Rachel was putting it, that suddenly is required to have a safe, safe space that tampers that communication of like, that's a problem. That's also a problem for EDI. That's not, that's not just a problem for marketplace of ideas, but it undermines the very goals that we're trying to get at in building just and fair societies where, where, where there's access to the plenty from all stratums of the community and not just for an elite few. Um, somebody else from the panel? Yeah, um, and I just want to continue that because um, I think it is really relevant, no matter um, which political spectrum you're from, um, it, it doesn't really matter because you'll always find people and communities that will kind of gather together. And mm. so it's interesting because I even had a student recently who came to me and he was, um, he created a men's only space and he was really afraid because of the criticism um, that was made by other students. And so, you know, he didn't have any kind of ill intention and he's like, prof, what do I do, right? And it's like, what can I do? So I'm like, okay, well, tell me how I can help you, right? So just having this restriction placed on people and even just no matter where you're coming from to feel like you can be muzzled before you begin, that's a really big issue. Um, I think that's where we are. That's where I feel. Yeah, yeah, quite, like, quite, like this is, and this is just a reality, and yeah. and it's so unfortunate. I, Why do you think we're here? That's that's what I mean, right? So yeah, how can we? How can we? I I think extreme on on both sides. Like, how is it that we've come to the point where we sanitize everything is also a really big issue for me as well. Where have we you read White Fragility, Robin D'Angelo? Pardon. What Robin D'Angelo's White Fragility, I, I would say that is a seminal text in the problems that I see with diversity and inclusion. It's a rhetorical tool to silence any opposition and basically to shunt them to the appropriate ideological response. Exactly. And it's like it's like what um, our friend over here said about Solzhenitsyn, where it's it's an ideology where you can turn the crank on the side of the head and the dogma pours out. And I've I've run into these people and they've drank the Kool Aid, man. It's it's terrifying. And it's and it's one of those things because he was so afraid of being labeled an incel. And I'm like, oh my goodness, you're 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 not at all. But 
where is this fear coming from? How is it? And so having these these conversations and then not fully knowing how we can kind of accomplish a task or a goal or even just the definitions. And I think that's also really important too. Um, so that's what I wanted to answer. Anyone else from the panel? Sure. Um, what was the specific question you had geared towards us? I'm curious as to what your understandings of uh, the more deep roots of critical theory, particularly um, Herbert Marcuse's work and uh, Theodore Adorno's work and how that influenced Robin D'Angelo. I mean, the book that I cited, White Fragility and it's the Anti-Racism Handbook, it's, it's recommended in a bunch of Ontario school boards. It's published in the Journal of Critical Pedagogy. So like this stuff is it's straight, she cites Herbert Marcuse. And this is the guy who wants to use black people as his new cannon fodder in his revolution, which I think is probably the most evil thing since the Nazi Germany. Yeah, um, I think that, you know, the idea behind a lot of what you've said is the idea that, you know, in society there are, you know, the oppressor class and the oppressed right. class. Right, and, that's, yeah. yeah it, it, it's from, it's a, an adaption of Marx's idea of the proletarian, the bourgeoisie, but um, I, I think you see a lot of, uh, you know, proponents of DEI sort of acting out in sort of this, um almost censorious way or Absolutely. you know sort of uh, what a lot of i guess social conservatives or just you know um conservative minded people in general will call like, like uh, i'm not even a conservative by any stretch just like the lunacy part here like yeah I, yeah but like my i think that you know just it's sort of built into the uh ide ideology I, strongly i think um like a lot of proponents of say critical race theory for example uh, they would say that they would put forward this theory of how of the world, you know, and you know you can agree or disagree with it, what what not, you know, that's fine. But then after they put forward this, you know, like view of like you know this lens of how to view the world, they sort of say that you know all those who uh, aren't committed to you know the doing the work, doing you know the work of anti-racism and you know sort of agreeing with you know this sort of uh, tenets of of critical uh, studies, you know, they're sort of uh, holding up sort of a white supremacist system. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're sort of, you know, um, uh, passive perpetrators uh, almost, well, well, right? I, like to not be, there's no such thing as um, being anti-racist or non-racist. It was like even Max Kennedy screwed, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of like, I think it, uh, like every 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 good intentioned person like doesn't want to be like a racist you know so it's it's sort of easy to you know introduce this into so, uh, educational academic yeah, environments because you... those good intentioned people so, so i think we're gonna to have to move on yeah um, no, sorry yeah. sorry for getting all worked up okay does it I can, I just, can i just say something real quick i think a lot of us in this room are late to the party meaning that there are people who have the an idea of the world as they want it and they've gone after that goal for a long time and a lot of us have been asleep and so i think that in order for us to be able to change the game it's <laughs> getting a little late at this point but occupy spaces occupy these spaces whether it's a new university or your school board or running for office you have to occupy these spaces for you to make any meaningful change we can complain all that we want here it's not going to change unless we get involved, cultivate the spaces that you want to see, work into the spaces, work to change legislation, work to change university policy, work to change your, your, your office policy, whatever it is. Otherwise, we'll be, we'll be way, we're, we're decades behind at this point, right? Dave, do you want to <laughs> No, I, no. I think these gentlemen have been okay. So okay, so we'd, we'd, we'd at, is, if, if if I can beg your indulgence to, Wait. is okay? Just we're at time, but if we can go over maybe just a little bit, is that okay? Yeah, sure. Okay, so we'll go to Eduardo. Okay, thank you. Um, I have one quick comment. I I really believe that we have become more just and aware societies. I have been here for thirty years, and I am very positive of the, the way we are going. Um, my name is Eduardo Smitia, and I teach economics at Capilano uh, University, and 
I want to thank you for having this uh, panel and the panelists for being here. Um, I will have an ex expand on a comment that my colleague did and then pose a question to the panel. So um, the EDI group, she mentioned that it failed and collapsed. And, and one of the reasons it collapsed, it was because it was being controlled by administration and it was engaging in superficial things, as some of you said. It was, uh, okay, let's do things that appear that things are great. And so at the end, the members um, say, we are not going to go along. Uh, and so that prompted the three unions to join uh, the student association the faculty association and the staff association, and they wrote write, uh, letters to the board and say, we need to engage uh, in, in actual, uh, meaningful actions. And the board mandated an equity uh, audit, and this is still in the process. We are still waiting for the results. But in the process, um, the faculty associations and the student associations engage in actions that are putting people that are marginalized or at the center of the decision making, at the center or the events. And that has proven to be quite successful and has overcome the paralyzation. So my question for the rest of the panel, have you seen that? Where it's maybe it's not individual actions, but the collective and broad coalitions of different fronts that can push for a more meaningful and participatory uh, a university. And, and that's what it boils down. It's not so much about academic freedom. It's about giving a space to people who have been traditionally excluded. That's, that's what we are trying to do, if I could start to say. Um, so I, I don't know if you have seen something similar or, or do you think that that might be some of the answer to make EDI uh, more meaningful. I hope my question is clear. Basically, how do we how do we do this content? well? <laughs> Who is it for? You said the other four. Any. Anyway. You haven't talked to us. Come on, Dave. So, I, help me narrow your question. What, what would you like me to answer? Um. What I'm trying to say is, have you seen in other spaces of higher education, the collective organizations coming together and pushing for, for change? Because if we do it at the individual level, mm -hmm. it's usually not going to work. Uh, at least our experience is like when we have people talking in committees and so on, it doesn't work. It's when you have the unions coming together and pressuring uh, administration to engage and put resources when things started to change. So have you seen that in other places of higher education? I, I hope I am I'm, I'm making sense. And I, I am biased on this because I come from Latin America. And so the unions there and sectors mm -hmm. are very strong and they can paralyze a country. But here it's a little bit more. Oh, they can do that here too. Yeah. Uh <laughs> I can tell you about policing. It, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the reason we haven't seen much change in policing is because of how strong some of those unions are. But I'll be fair to police associations in saying, you know what, I, I've never pre... So I'll, I'll use this example. One of the committees I'm a part of that you heard, in its first iteration, in terms of composition, we had board representatives who would come. The senior command of the service was there. Uh, we had representatives from the Ontario Human Rights Commission, Office of the Independent Police Review Director. We still have the uh, Office of the Information Pri Privacy Commissioner engaged. And we had more community members and institutions and the like. Far more wholesome. When I joined, the union wasn't there. Now we have this smaller iteration of the community of the committee. We still don't have the police union at the table. And some of the other stak stakeholders are missing. And for me, I find it lacking because if the union may be the biggest barrier to the change, I want the union at the table. I need the union to be at the table so that we're not communicating through and having this kind of Chinese telephone thing and the message gets lost. If I look at what's happened in the university space, so post George Floyd, I remember my, my alma mater, McGill, you know, undertook to do uh, an anti-Black racism 
action plan. It's going to involve meeting with the Black students across campus and facilitating sessions here about what their experiences were and what the institution needed to do and put forward recommendations. So that that is what I've seen since. I mean, if you ask me, systemic change is always going to require the collect require collective input. Systemic change doesn't get driven by one individual because that one individual may not be the decision maker, right? Or even one of the very many decision makers that are necessary. And it's not about just satisfying the needs or the concerns of one individual, but you will need the many. Thank you. Anybody else from the panel? I just, I haven't seen that. So thank you for sharing that because I've not seen it. So I, it's I, an interesting occurrence. Yeah, and you, that Pruitt experience that we can share is until we have the three unions working together, it, it was very little change. And so maybe it's something that can be replicated, Kai. Have a broad coalition and say, if not, we are going to shut down the essentially the place. Well, I, I'll just quickly add mm -hmm. one of the things, I mean, you've been here for 30 years, so three times as long as me. One of the things Canadians are used to is we have commissions of inquiry. We have independent reviews. Uh, you saw that with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Missing and Murdered in, uh, Indigenous Women's Commission, Mass Casualty Commission over in Halifax. Uh, in Ontario, we had Justice Tell lead the Independent Street Checks Review and the Independent Police Oversight Review. And of course, all the key stakeholders, or at least individuals who are concerned about those issues will engage in those processes. Of course, they are slightly, they're somewhat political because it requires the government of the day or the deciding body to constitute that commission or review. And then they still get to decide if they'll accept our recommendations to implement them or not. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, I think we probably better wrap up. So um, I'm going to say a huge thank you to the panel. Oh, let Mark uh, but, oh, oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. let go. Okay, well, let Mark go. Come on. Come on. Oh, I just say it's a, actually a quick response to that. Okay. So you framed this as EDI as a, a liberal construct. I think that was the, the exact words Pe you people used. People may say it as such. Okay. I said people may say it as such. And I, I want to challenge that because I think there's at least three different versions of, of EDI that I've heard and some of it's been, ex there's at least two versions been represented at the discussions. I'm, firstly, I should have said, thank you very much for being here. It's been a really great discussion. Um, just to go back then. So you know, when this sort of first started to be implemented in university setting, it was very consistent with liberal principles, right? The idea, you know, there was respect for the individual, and respect for freedom and the emphasis was on trying to remove barriers from participation and, and trying to ensure that bias wasn't creeping into processes so hiring processes you you know you had to basically ask the same questions to everybody and all this sort of stuff um which is all all entirely consistent with liberal principles no problem at all what seems to so there's there's this respect for the individual and sort of respect for freedom Right, and we seem to have been in a shift shifting along two different dimensions in relation to that. There's been a shift from sort of respecting individuals to uh, focusing on groups. So in people end up being avatars of groups of various sorts of kinds, right? Rather than individuals, they're avatars of groups, and we're judging them according to that. I mean, we've heard suggestions today about hiring on the basis of group identity, or that should be a major consideration. That's not a liberal principle, right? A liberal principle would be hiring on the basis of the merit of the individual. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one dimension in which we've shifted away from a sort of liberal conception of this. And the other one is a shift from sort of respecting freedom to mandatory uh, EDI, right? And, and so those two things, so that's, that's also, I mean, you know, liberals are very big on freedom and have been, you know, for hundreds of years and all of a sudden we're in a position of actually now we're going to have mandatory uh, requirements in relation to edi so in, in both of those dimensions the shift from the individual to the the group and the shift from sort of uh, encouraging people to do things mm -hmm. versus telling them to do it on pain of some sort of punishment those are moves away from uh, liberal positions that you know suggest to me that, that you, I, I've encountered. I would say I've encountered 
liberal people or people with liberal principles trying to do EDI. Mm -hmm. I've encountered people who, who uh, think in terms of groups, but are okay with persuasion. And then there's the other people who think in terms of groups and like to force people to do things. So there's at least three different groups of people trying to implement EDI. And they're very different. It seems to me that they're very sort of different undertakings. And if you think about what sort of triggering people's reactions, right, it's, it's not really, I don't think it's really the liberal conception mm -hmm. of, you know, let, let's try and remove barriers and treat people as individuals and persuade people. It's the, it's the, the other ones that are causing the issues as far as I can see. Sorry, so, that was that was a very long short question. No, 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 c'est bien. Uh, I will I will concede. When I when I use the term liberal, I probably meant le I did mean more on the yeah. left left wing kind of thing, not maybe the classical liberal definition. Got me a good hook to hang it. <laughs> but um, you know, here's the here's the thing with mandatory, and you I think Khaled spoke to it. Mind you, I was studying at this time, but she would have spoken to it about when you make training mandatory, it can have adverse effects. And I, and I see that and I appreciate that. And, and you heard me say, I don't do any presentation that is mandatory for the people who are going to come to it. You need it to have come of your own free will, your own choice, because of what I know can happen as a result. Here's what happens. And, and I appreciate that, what the research will tell me. And I can also appreciate the fear on the other side. So for the, the oppressed groups, the minority groups, if we... Just look, if we focus on this idea of, let's say, training, let's say training or education, for example, whenever we do reviews or commissions or doing consultations, people say, you need to make this mandatory for, for that group. They need to learn this. They need to learn this. And, I, and, I, and I'll sit there sometimes in my head and I'm going, oh, if they only knew that making it mandatory will harm them. But here's their fear. If you don't make it mandatory for them, how else are they going to learn? Right? They want them to learn. So it's, both groups may want the same thing, but don't realize that this process or this tool that you want to use to do it in its design may not be the best way to do it. So we can have training and education, but it may be best that it's not mandatory. But they're, so, but they're very, very worried about if they, don't, if they don't all get it, then what is going to happen? Because then them not getting the training may mean an adverse effect for me, but in the same way making it mandatory for them still creates an adverse effect for you. So I, I, you know, I, I struggle with when things are mandatory or not because I, I know what people are trying to get at. The diversity quotas always come up as an issue. We need quotas. And you'll get some who say, if you don't have quotas like with salespeople, you may never meet your targets, right? It gives you something that you have to aim towards. The flip side of it is, and I, and I think the perspective of the underrepresented groups sometimes get lost in this too is no one from any of these groups wants you to hire them or have them be involved with something just because they hit that checkbox. I don't think any doctor would want to know that the patient sees them as just you got into medical school just because and you aren't qualified. That doctor wants you to trust in them as forget that they're black or if you recognize that they're black, that they're just as qualified as a, as a doctor that is Chinese, East Asian, South Asian, whatever the case may be. But if you deal with me as a black lawyer, it's not because I'm black that should be of issue. It's I went through the same formation and education as the guy at Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, whatever the case may be. I'm qualified and I'm competent. But people make these assumptions thinking, oh yeah, the oppressed groups want that to happen. It, it's, it's, more, it's more mixed than that. People want you to trust in them and believe that they are just as qualified, but there is this other thing that's there. Uh, Sonia? Yeah. Um, about that, um, uh, a, lot, uh, a couple of universities in Canada have implemented a sort of cluster hiring of black faculty. Um, SFU also has approved that, the board has approved cluster hiring of black faculty. And I, the problem I see is, just like you mentioned, uh, who gets to trust the, the, the ability and the capability, the knowledge of these faculties when they're finally hired? Because everyone would know that you are just a diversity hire. 
and how does that how does that mesh with with department morale how do your students see you how 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 competent do you feel yourself as as, as a professor knowing that you are part of a group a quarter sort of it, to me, it, it's, it feels counterproductive, um, and and that's not the way to to increase uh, the participation or the engagement of of uh, black scholars within universities in Canada. Uh, another thing I wanted to talk about is uh, something you mentioned uh, about group preferences or uh, sort of group politics in within uh, EDI. Uh, we also get to the point where. It, because of intersectionality, certain groups matter more than the other. Um, for instance, I, I've, I've, I've come to understand that I probably have a ceiling uh, in, in Can most Canadian universities, as if you included, in terms of my advancement, because one, I will not say land acknowledgements, and I will not include pronouns in my signature. And I know that despite the fact that I'm Nigerian, I'm I don't use the word black. I don't call myself black. Um, despite the fact that I'm Nigerian Canadian, that identity marker will not help me because I'm not willing to adopt those practices. So I definitely see where you're coming from, where you have we definitely have a group of people uh, within, within a lot of administrations and universities where it is conform or else. Right. So it's not it's it's not it's definitely not individualistic. It's definitely not uh, um, based on preference or based on on reasoned arguments. It's this is the way we want to go with certain things. And these are the things you have to do uh, if you want to exist peacefully in that space. Well, I mean, ironically, what you've just illustrated at some level is not even to do with the identity groups that they say they're standing up for because it's actually to do with the attitudes and the beliefs of the people you know so it it's a weird sort of you know we're, we're in a very weird position in relation to this i think it's a very yeah there's, there's and we'll just maybe just have some brief final comments <laughs> uh yeah i'll try and make it quick um yeah yeah you said uh you mentioned how a lot of uh some of the DEI community sort of has like this like illiberal bent almost. And I think that's because, you know, like what what, what is DEI? DEI is the fruit of, of a lot much larger tree, you know, and uh it, it goes back to you know intersectionality, which goes back to critical race studies, critical race theory, uh you know, fe feminist theory, uh queer theory. Uh, and I have a lot more familiar with critical race theory. Um one of the one of the ideas of critical race theory is that it, it is the liberal sort of system was sort of constructed uh, in order to perpetuate white supremacy and to uh, sort of allow white supremacy to flourish even in light of supposed progress that has been made. Uh, so they really point to the, the liberal system itself as being a problem, as being causative, uh, as being a causative factor. Uh, you hear a lot of uh, opposition to like neoliberalism, for example, uh, because this is the belief that you know, uh, sort of un, uh, unqualified freedom sort of um, leads to people making you know, the, the wrong decisions. Uh, I think the way that's manifest, the way that emerges, is you know you have uh, corporations or you have uh, uh, col college boards uh, sort of uh, forcing you know faculty or staff to sign on to diverse equi equity and inclusion statements. Um, and that, that's not uh, like a very liberal thing to do. It's very, it's very illiberal. Um, when you have uh, when, when you have uh, uh, positions that are open only to people of a certain uh, race, you know, for example, uh, the, the University of Calgary, they're uh, bringing in uh, cluster hiring. Uh, you have the uh, University of Ottawa. Uh, they have multiple positions on their website. Uh, for example, a position for a public management uh, professor that's only open to racialized or indigenous peoples or an anti-racism education professor that's only available to racialized and ind indigenous people. These aren't like very liberal things, but it's but part of the reason of that is because I don't think liberal liberalism is prior prioritized uh, in you know the diverse equity and inclusion community. Now that's being very broad in general. I think there are a lot of uh, there are liberals in the classic sense uh, within 
you know, the DEI community. And I think, you know, a lot of, there are a lot of people within the DEI community that do value liberty, but uh, I don't think it's necessarily a priority. And when you look at the goals of DEI, uh, liberalism isn't necessarily, um, it's not that liberalism is mutually exclusive with the goals of DEI, but it's not necessarily a priority either. You know, so that's why you can have those different sects, those different factions that, you know, may be more uh, liberal in the classic sense, but uh, you also have the more illiberal uh, sects of uh, the DEI community. So um, just an example of, of lived experience. So I was an equity uh, placement at McGill Law School. I, I, there were two people with disabilities. I was one of them. Um, I did not have a good LSAT score. I had a pretty decent GPA, but definitely what put me over, it was my life experience as a person with a disability. And I will tell you that um, that did equal the playing field for me because I could not compete with uh, my, my colleagues who were not disabled and who'd, you know, had summer interns abroad and all kinds of things like that. So um, I disagree that affirmative action has no place in making society just uh, equitable and fair. Um, but back to your comment, I think you're right. There are three different um, strands of equity that we're talking about here and three different um, ways of expressing it. And my my challenge to the first way of expressing it is that, you know, the ideology that uh, liberalism um, and freedom um, are absolute values is incorrect. Um, it that first that first context that you point out, where you know we we don't discriminate, we're not biased, we give everyone the same shot. Unfortunately, not everyone is starting at the same place. So if you don't have some sort of leveling of the playing field, you're not really talking about equity. You're just talking about reinforcing the privilege that already exists. Thank you. Grace, do you want to jump in? I feel like everyone's getting antsy as well. Um, the future, I just want to end on a closing note. The future is going to be weird. And it's going to be <laughs> amazing and a lot of heartbreak. But I, I feel like just us being here just means we're in for the ride, like whatever it might be. So that's where I'm coming from. Thank you. OK, well, I just want to say a huge thank you to the panel and for everyone for sticking <laughs> and uh, for the overtime. Emphasis on the weird. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so I'll be wrapping things up. So for people online, thank you so much for sticking around. And uh, that's a wrap. So thanks. Thank you.